Well, Phil, I, th- I think that's Ellen. Just quickly hide under the bed. Just, just one second. <clears throat> oh, hi. Uh, hey, hey. Uh, sorry, I was running a bit late this morning, but I am here. I'm ready for our interview with Peter and Stephen. Very oh, exciting. Yeah. Um. No, that's actually tomorrow. We're not. That's not today. Uh, it says in my diary today. Yeah. Kind of a big deal. That's uh. So you know, with uh, America to Australia, the time difference, and I can understand. So you know, with daylight savings too, it's it's actually so. Even it says today, but that's yes. for America. But for us, it's tomorrow. Right, but why was our calendar set to today? Because I want to um, be more... I, I want to get into the heads more and be more Americanized. So I just wanted to write it their way. Um, okay. And why is the Skype set up then on the computer? I'm testing I'm testing the connection for tomorrow to make sure it works. So yeah, I'm, I've got sexy Chris. Uh, he will be doing it with me and then I'm just testing it to make sure it all... Works well for all of us to do it tomorrow. Right. The the three of us. Tomorrow. The three of us. Yes, absolutely. Phil's mic set up right now. I I'm testing his mic as well. Um I'll do Phil's I'll I'll do Phil's voice. Uh, hello. You know, h- hello testing. Yes, one two. Yes. Oh, thank you. I'm Phil. Yes. Yeah, uh-huh. yes. It's working. It's working well. Um uh, yep. Are you trying to get rid of me? No. No, absolutely. Why would I do that? That's that's ridiculous. You want to have this interview all to yourself, uh, don't you? I wouldn't dream of it, Ellen. You are you are the glue that holds this podcast together. I would. If you're not. trying to get rid of me. I'm going to end you. There will be consequences. I will take those consequences. But if I was doing that, but I, I'm not doing that. I it's tomorrow. I promise. Okay, then I will see all of us. Here again tomorrow for our interview. Yes. Correct? Correct. Absolutely. Tomorrow, right. uh, on good old fashioned American time, tomorrow. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'll see you then. Bye. Okay, Phil, you can come out now. Baby beard! <laughs> This episode traumatised me as a young person. (laughs) My head is hurting again. (laughs) Where's my firstborn son? God does not care about me masturbating. Your singing is bad and you should feel bad. (laughs) First get out into the bus, you're like, oh no! (laughs) I don't like myself becoming the protagonist of this podcast. (laughs) You've been in the the one anything. Shut up and take my podcast. There we go. It was a simple, easy one this time around. Nice. Did you like it? I uh, loved it. Okay. Well, okay. Should we just get on to it? Let's get on Welcome, it. everybody, to Shut Up and Take My Podcast, the Futurama podcast that pits episode against episode in a bloody, glorious gauntlet battle for your entertainment. And this week, it is a side mission where we deviate from our regularly scheduled program to give you something a little different because you're worth it. As always, I'm joined here by Phil. 20 years. Oh, I'm feeling really old now. <laughs> I'm joined here by Stephen. That's me. <laughs> right? Stephen Sandoval? That's you. I, I am joined Futurama here. Drama director? Oh, no. <laughs> no. I'm joined here by Peter. Hey, baby, you want to kill all humans? <laughs> hey, funny? Nice. Way to go, me back. <laughs> and we're all joined by Sean. So I've actually brought you guys here to pitch you both a TV show. That's fine, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, sure. Talk to our agents. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, guys, this is actually a pretty special episode. We are just, as of recording, we are a few days removed from the 20th anniversary of Futurama as a series. Um, and Yay! Woo! To that end, it's kind of serendipitous that we have two Futurama... Well, you know what? I'll give them the introductions they deserve. So, first of all, he's an Annie-nominated director. He's worked on such shows as Rick and Morty, The Wild Thornberries, Gravity Falls, and Rapunzel's Tangled Adventure. For Futurama, he's directed episodes including The Prisoner of Bender, Law and Oracle, and The Bots and the Bees. If you look him up, he's also apparently a boxer, a skateboarder, a doctor, and a mariachi singer. <laughs> he is Stephen Sandoval. Hello, Stephen yes. Sandoval. Hello, hello. Thank Thank you very Please. much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. And our second guest, he's an Emmy-winning director. He's worked on such shows as Ren and Stimpy, Duckman, Drawn Together, and Disenchantment. For Futurama, he's directed episodes including The Series Has Landed, The Late Philip J. Fry, and Meanwhile. He also, if his word is to be believed, he holds an acting credit for the voice of a booger. He's Peter Avancino. <laughs> I did not play a booger. I played a magic nose goblin. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm glad That's we right. cleared that up. Let's, let's be specific. <laughs> I actually had to go back and watch that episode, and there's about five boogers, so I was wildly unclear of which one you were. But I take your word for it. Well, uh, once again, there's no boogers. <laughs> there's five magic nose goblins. Yeah, you know, so no and boogers. I'm the one who says, he talks to farts, man. That's you? Yeah. How oh, was that you? That. Oh my god, all these years. <laughs> the royalty checks from that, you would just roll it in. <laughs> oh my god. I mean, I'm glad I didn't know that until now because if, you know, when we were working together, I probably would have, you know, like been like ultimate fanboy like, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> it's that nose goblin. <laughs> right, it ain't uncomfortable over here. <laughs> <laughs> First and foremost, thank you very much for um, coming onto the podcast. I'll just peel back the curtain very quickly. I actually contacted a Stephen about a, a little while back and just said, you know, hi, do you want to come on the show? <laughs> and yeah, he, he, he basically was very nice about it. Uh, and he said yes. And then he said, you know, just, just hold on for a second. And then he disappeared for a day or two. And then he came back and said, yeah, I got my buddy Peter Avancino on. Uh, we'll, we'll both come on. That's cool. And I was like, okay, awesome. Great. Yeah. And, you know, without, without me asking. So it's very, very nice of you guys. And we appreciate you giving up your Friday evening. We appreciate any attention given to the art side of the show. Yeah. And also, I pulled in Pete as an act of desperation because I couldn't do it alone by myself. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen I'll... can do more than you <laughs> <laughs> So, So, guys, uh, as we mentioned, uh, it's the uh, – we just had the 20th anniversary of the show. Did you do anything to celebrate? Oh my. Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> I mean, no. I worked on uh, Disenchantment. Yeah, and I was on the Owl House for Disney, coming soon to a Disney Channel near you. I'll tell you what I did 20 years ago. Yes, please. At the, at the premiere party for uh, Futurama, which was held at the Griffith Observatory, and we got to go into the planetarium, the dome-roofed place, and they, you know, we sat in the chairs where you're, like, facing up the ultimate recliners and they pretty much screened it on the ceiling of the exploratorium, which is not the best picture, but it was a lot of fun. It was really neat. It was probably the, one of the more unique uh, premiere parties I've ever been to. D- did you guys know from the beginning, obviously it's coming off the back of this is the second Matt Groening show. So there's a certain amount of hype and expectation behind it. But did you guys already know by that point that you'd, you'd hit something special or something that was going to kind of blow up the way that it did? No, it it didn't blow up at the beginning. I mean, it Fox uh, aired it at weird <clears throat> at weird times. And, you know, we were on at seven thirty. We got preempted by football like every week. <laughs> and even back when I was on The Simpsons, before that, you know, you didn't even know if you were going to be picked up next year because uh, stuff just they weren't you know they weren't a phenomenon at the time. They were just a show that was on, and you hope that uh, it'll be on again next year. I worked on The Simpsons before that, so I was very spoiled with premiere parties. You know, the Simpsons <laughs> would have in the beginning they were like in a sound stage on the Fox lot and they would just have bands and video games and I was, you know, pretty young. So I love just playing video games. <laughs> <laughs> so um and, uh, a lot of food and When you say fun. when you say bands, was that Steven Sandoval's mariachi band that played at the the rap party I as wish. well. I wish. <laughs> they couldn't afford me. <laughs> For both of you, um, you both started as storyboard artists uh, before you started as directors. Every, everyone always talks about when I see these interviews, they mention, oh, and, and then you got your first professional gig here, and, and then it just went to here and here. But I'm more interested about what came all before that. Like, Namely, kind of, you know, as kids or when you're going through high school, was this, was the idea of becoming a storyboard artist or a director in itself was that something you had as a young child or was it just a hobby because i know that for peter you went on to study what well, architecture <laughs> um so how did that kind of blossom into something that became a viable professional um endeavor well i actually literally got in through the back door of animation i i, I desperately needed a job i wanted to be i was a failed comic book artist and um i knew someone through a series of jobs i I met someone who was working at Warner Brothers, and then he said, oh, hey, if you're looking for work, you should come to Warner Brothers. And so I dropped off my portfolio. Like, how did you know this person? I Well, I was... I Delivered groceries for that? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I cleaned the swimming pool. I was like, hey, you got me work? Um, no, I was, I was working at a firm down in Santa Monica, California, and um, I got that job because I was able to 
<laughs> I was able to do packaging design for the land. So you were working as an artist? Barely. Barely. <laughs> I mean, this is back in the day when you could find art jobs in the one ads. In these things called newspapers, I don't think they have those anymore. No, I haven't seen one for but, a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, they did um, advertise that stuff because they didn't want to pay a professional artist. Right. So they got so me. They look for students and yeah. things like that. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. So I, I, I met someone who was working at Warner Brothers. He said, oh, you should t- you should submit your portfolio on this new show that I'm working on. So I did. And then I heard back like three days later from Warner Brothers. And they said that, you know, oh, yeah, thank you for your portfolio, but we're going to pass. So I was just like, I was despondent. I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I said, I was avoiding going back and picking up my, my portfolio and doing the walk of shame. So finally I said, look, you just got to do it. You got to figure out what your next step is. So I, I'm walking into Warner Brothers and I bump into the guy that told me to drop off my portfolio. And he said, oh, hey, are, did they hire you? And he said, I said, no. And he said, what? And he said, yeah, they passed on me. He says, come with me. And he literally took me in the back door of Warner Brothers. <laughs> And we met his producer, and they hired me, and I've been there now for over 20 years working in animation. Crazy. So, I mean, so just yeah. just from that, following on, so from there, what was the first gig that you worked on uh, through them? You really want me to say I want to say <laughs> Yeah, I want to I I hear this. <laughs> it, it, it was a show called Hysteria. Oh, H-I-O. I didn't know that. Didn't know that Get one. out of here. Oh, <laughs> damn, I've been shamed. Um, Hysteria it was a history-based comedy show there's a lot of air quotes like animating acts about history exactly <clears throat> and um yeah so I, that was my first uh, first animation job as a character designer and then there was a um a spot that opened up for storyboard so i moved into storyboard and then about five or seven years later i uh i was on another show at warner brothers after going back to warner brothers and i uh, put my name in for uh, for a directing spot and, and did you it. direct there at uh, on Shaolin Showdown, okay, for Warner Brothers. Because so, I met Stephen when we needed a director on Drawn Together. Drawn Together. Yeah, I was very happy to hire him to direct for uh-huh. that. So, and I mean, um, Shaolin Showdown for you, Stephen. That was yes. the first uh, series that you directed on, wasn't it? As opposed to being a storyboard artist. So, I mean, right. how did how did you go from transitioning from storyboard artist to director? Was that an, a natural progression, or is it something they just asked you to do? Was it something that you had always endeavored to do? How did that How did that uh, take form? Yeah, well, I always wanted to. I always wanted to direct. I mean, everyone always says that I want to direct, but I actually I wanted to. And um, on, on Shaolin Showdown, there was a vacancy that opened up. One of the directors there was moving on to a new series that he was developing. So I walked into the EP's office and said, look, I, I know there's probably other people in front of me. I don't want to step on any toes, but I would like to put my, you know, throw my hat in the ring. And so the EP, Eric Radomsky, who, you know, of, of Batman, the animated series fame, said, you know what? I think you'd be great for it. And and that was it. They have to pay new guys less, so it's always a, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good bargain. Yeah. And I guarantee they saw Stephen's talent and said, if we can get him now, oh. then that's that's good to do it. In uh, prime time and even in uh, Saturday morning stuff, the director now is generally a story person. They're the ones guide working with the with storyboard artists who are also talented, but maybe you know, aren't making the best decisions yet and need some more training. And so as a director, I like to hire story people and move them up into directing um, because they really need to just get the show laid out and planned and shot for shot and get the acting drawn right. And then it it goes on to other things like timing, um, which if you have experienced timers who take your storyboard poses and, and, uh, Time them. Sorry, I keep using the word time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> place them on into the show with with uh, the amount of frames that make them yeah. look alive and make them look interesting and stuff. And uh, I'm I'm really a director can learn that um, and and see. You know, as they get better, they'll they'll learn about timing, and that will only make their stuff better. Well, what he's not telling you is that he's like the master of timing. I mean, well, when I started, I didn't know how to time. And yeah, uh, our but, timing director, Don Judge, uh, I would go to, when I, when I was a storyboard was artist, I wanted to direct because, uh, I would draw all the poses that I thought go, go where they should go. And then when I'd see the show, they go, well, they didn't even put them where they're supposed to go. So it doesn't even make any sense. And so <laughs> I didn't want to keep storyboarding and handing it to someone else who, uh, maybe didn't care or just, 
you know, it just went into a cookie cutter thing. So yeah. that's, I got my chance on Duckman right. again. Uh, they got me for uh, storyboard wages, pretty much. Lasky <laughs> Chupo paid very, very low. But I got a ton of experience, and I really loved working on that show. And it is one of those things. Where, I mean, there are. I mean, even to this day. I mean, uh, Pete, you and I haven't worked together for like what seven years now? Six years? I thought it was like two. <laughs> <laughs> I've been at Disney for over five. But um, there are still times where, when I'm when I'm uh, checking exposure sheets. I still think of, you know, like, well, how would Pete break this scene down? And how would he lay out the the overlapping, uh, you know, action of this particular character? Because you guys are familiar with X sheets, correct? Yes. <laughs> okay. No, I'm just checking. Really? Some, sometimes some of the listeners are like, I'll probably end up saying yes to anything you ask me just to impress <laughs> you. But yes. Well, the X sheets, you know, they use those at NASA, you know, the whole thing with the set. No, I'm just kidding. Wow. <laughs> for, for your listeners, <laughs> an X sheet is a chart. That one line equals one twenty fourth of a second. Yeah, one frame. So every twenty four lines equals one second, and you literally write down where every single drawing goes on those charts. I mean, it's and pretty it's much excruciatingly yeah. detailed. It's very tedious, but uh-huh. it's also that's where your show lives and dies as yeah. far as the the animation and, and how you want it to really play out. And then, of course, you also have to rely on the the studios, whoever it's going to they're able to actually, you know, uh, make the drawings that are appropriate for that particular yeah. exposure. So but like, I, again, a lot of shows have, have, um, patterns that they want. They're very snappy or cartoony. They go to a natural. pose and just hold it for a long time and then snap to the next pose. But on most of the shows I worked on, including duck man, uh, F- and Simpsons and Futurama, we, even though it is, a cartoon, we we tend we want it to be timed out so that like it's somewhat realistic, or and the natural. emotions uh, play and the comedy plays, and so there is no cookie cutter. So we look for timers who look at the drawings and say, "What's the best way to do this?" Yeah. Even with you know Bender, Bender to me is a very convincing emotional character. Oh, definitely. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually was rewatching uh, Bots and the Bees uh, earlier today. And um, I remember when we got the record from John, uh, yeah. from John my, me and my, my uh, assistant director, Amy Steinberger, we were like almost in tears because, I mean, he, he played it totally straight. So we thought, oh, my God, this would be a great opportunity to, to play this moment, this heartfelt moment when, you know, uh, um, Ben is about to be have his, have his memory erased. And Bender's really broken up about it. So we thought, we're going to melt this. We're going to play it for the really straight, like, emotional heartstrings. And then, of course, the professor comes and chops his head off with a chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just going to ask, is that a bit of a nerve-wracking process when you've done all your preparation and then you, you send it off to the studio and you, you're not sure what's going to come back? Or is there this I- implicit trust that you, you know what work they're kind of going to do for you? Since, since it's being sent overseas... We try, we, what we do here is the storyboards. We do the X sheets. We do all the designs and we color everything. We send them color models. So you're trying to make it goof proof. Yeah. So that, right, it, yeah. so you know what's going to come back. Now it's going to humans, not going to computers. So <laughs> no, big when surprise. it comes Sorry. back, there are some surprises and some of them are things you did wrong. Some are, are just mistakes. And also sometimes there are things that they did incredibly oh, right yeah. where you're just like, Oh my God, they added like, uh, I, I know, I know there was one bit in, uh, 40%, uh, lead belly, lead belly. Thank you very much. I'm not being prompted. I know the titles by heart. Um, <laughs> but, um, like when Bender was playing the guitar and I think it was toward the end of the, the funeral uh, sequence, it's like, wow, they really did some really nice animation. Sure. So, I mean, there was someone that well, was there's actually good really people. There's good animators. Yeah. And sometimes and you, better animators, and you just don't know. I mean, you might get the, what we call the A crew. where are like, oh my God, they put all this great, subtle, nuanced air, um, acting in it. Or sometimes you'll get the, yeah. the C crew but, or the S crew. But we get it back from Korea and uh, we look at it. And then we spend about a month or about three weeks fixing it up before we show it to Matt Groening and, and then we spend more time, and it, it all it, it it always comes out great. Mm-hmm. When I started uh, supervising, and I would tell directors, the first thing I tell them is, watch it, and then just put it away and sit for a day because you're going to hate it. Because <laughs> for the last <laughs> three months while well, it's overseas, it's you've just been playing in your head the way you want it to look, and it's not going to look like that. That's right. And you got to just watch it, 
and then allow yourself to digest it, and, you know, because it's not going to be what you want, but it might be good. You don't know. Oh my so, God, it's so true. So when you're talking about uh, directing an episode, you, you've talked a lot about the animation side. So your work as an animation director. I, I saw that one of, uh, so David X. Cohen's, one of his jobs is to be the voice director for the series. Do you guys have any say or any sort of uh, impression on how uh, the performances go down? So the actual voices through Billy and, and John, or is that very much a case of the, the performances are given to you and you have to work your yeah. vision around that? That's, we, that's, yeah, that's way above our pay grade. Well, <laughs> it, it's it's the way it it's the way it's done on yeah. these shows. Yeah. Have you ever worked on a show where you got to be in there for that? As a director, yes. Okay, yeah, like at Disney, um, uh, we did have that option. I mean, we couldn't actually weigh in on how. But you could say something if you if you yeah. thought like, hey, he should be running. Can exactly. We or if there was like, you know, can we get like an intonation? And they would say, no, fuck off. And then we would have to just, <laughs> sit and just sort of be happy with whatever the yeah. voice director or the writer. Did. Well, when I was, when I was at Klasky Chupo on Duckman, they had a, the recording studio there. Right. So I got to be in on it. Yeah. And I would say stuff, but yeah, mostly you sit back and yeah. do it. And uh, I got to be in on the audio edit, on the mix, mm -hmm. on the Foley. And then when I went to Futurama, it's it's much more divided. Like right. the writers are on the Fox lot; they write the show. The actors come well, in. They, they and write David, the show. Yeah, David directs them. So yeah. most of the time, we get a script and an audio track, and and then it's it's on us. And we can go to the writers, and if we have a problem, which is not often, but you know, hey, can I cut this line? It's not you know, we don't need it because we see this or. It's harder to say, can you add a line here? Like, if we want to do that, we might have to temp it in and they'll add it later. With Futurama, with David, he was very open to that kind of stuff. So it was really nice. Yeah. Even, that being said, it's a script and it's a track. And all, our job is to make it look the best we can. Yeah. So sometimes things do get kind of cut from episodes, uh, little moments or gags. Have they ever cut something you're really proud of? Oh, yeah. Uh, like what, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Well, I just remember on some shows they would edit it really tight, and I was yeah, there's that. I used to it used to bug me that uh, you know they just take out all the breaths and all the emotion for gags. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's a you know comedy writers want faster pace than I might want. Yeah. Um, I can't think of uh, here's my biggest the I biggest thing I lost I was on the Simpsons because <laughs> I storyboarded Bart the Daredevil. <laughs> and that show, they cut out like five minutes of it Ugh. for the premiere of a Michael Jackson video. <laughs> that, and then and then on all subsequent uh, uh, episodes, they never put that stuff back in. So, like, there's a moment when they're driving home from Truckasaurus where everyone's remembering their favorite parts. And, you know, Mag Lisa's remembering them watching her play sax. And there was one of Maggie. It was her POV of her in her car seat when Trekosaurus is rocking the car back and forth. So it's her POV of everybody just flying. And they, <laughs> they cut that out. And, and they never put it back in. And, and they wind up with a five-minute short show that they never <laughs> they never put it back in. <laughs> so, so now from now on, you're going to just run extra commercials whenever you run this episode. <laughs> and we're going like, yes, more commercials. But everyone remembers that Michael Jackson had more tampon uh, commercials. <laughs> Peter, uh, just a question for you. When you so it was ninety eight when Futurama really started gearing up to hit its first season, and that was the time that you joined Rough Draft. Can you can you talk to us a little bit about? I'm interested in what the environment of Rough Draft was because at that point they just worked on Max, uh, which was the first time, as far as I can see, that three D uh, was integrated into a two D animation series, and so Futurama was set to be the second show that did that. And uh, I was listening to Claudia Katz, a producer for Futurama, and she talked about how Rough Draft expanded from 18 people to something like 60 in that year. So what was the environment like in Rough Draft in that first year and gearing up and doing Futurama uh, in that initial year? Those were the good old days. <laughs> uh, I was when drugs. Rough Draft was very small and uh, they when they formed, they did a lot of Butterfinger commercials with Matt. They did some of the videos. Greg Vanzo was the owner and, they, and the, an animator who did all that stuff. So when Futurama was coming, Matt said, oh, I'd like Rough Draft to do it. But Fox was not really on board with that idea because they were so small. 
and they wanted Phil Roman to do it. And Matt was, you know, with good reason, not willing to have this be his big battle before the show even started. So then Rough Draft said, well, you know, they're sitting around waiting and, the, and uh, Rich Moore and Greg and Claudia said like, well, let's let's just do 30 seconds. So they put together some animation and they showed it and it caused some friction. But long story short, they wound up getting the show over it. Before that, I had been I had said, hey, I'd love to work on this. And uh, I had an offer from SpongeBob that was starting up at the very same time. Right. And I was oh, put, wow. <clears throat> putting them off. I really would have loved to work on that too, but I think my inklings were towards uh, this primetime Futurama. So I had the benefit of not working on Simpsons because when Rough Draft got it, they were told you cannot hire anyone from the Simpsons. So I had been off the Simpsons for a number of years. So I came in and it was a very like, this is new. Come on, let's get started. I, I came in and started storyboarding on the first episode um, while waiting for the second one. And, you know, all the directors and ADs and board artists were really, you know, it was exciting. We we're pulling together to get this thing done. That first episode kind of had a big rewrite. Um, they, it was, it was good, but some of the flow of it didn't quite work. So then I, I thought it went up to maybe a hundred people. We, we did a layout back then, which is character layout, which are kind of animation size drawings. Like we would storyboard it first. Then storyboards back then were, were just much simpler. They were smaller and uh, they just kind of broke down each shot. They didn't get into the acting a lot. And then it would go to layout artists who each each scene had its own folder and the layout paper, which is like a like, feature. Yeah. So kind of key animation, they're hitting the key poses and they're figuring out exactly how everybody works with the backgrounds and stuff. And so that's, that's a lot of people right there. And it was, it was exciting. I mean, we, you know, pretty young, I was actually young then, young crew, <laughs> uh, all having a lot of fun. We would uh, have incredible Halloween parties. Uh, yeah, Did you ever go to any of those? I, I went to like maybe the last one. Porno? No, I just, I, I, it was the hee haw one that oh, I went to. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. The, the hee haw one. I'm sorry. Next question, please. Well, they had already run out of <laughs> all the science fiction and porno and uh, por- porno theme parties, superhero oh, wow. parties. Cool. So they, they did a, a hee haw <clears> theme. Um, yeah. Sean was talking a bit about uh, the integration of like the 3D animation to the show. Was, is that something that you were like looking for opportunities to to include, or or did it come quite organically that that a moment kind of uh, lent itself to using the animation style? I, I'm not sure. I would. I uh, I came in like you said. They had been doing the Max. Uh, Greg Vanzo is a great, incredible animator who owned the studio. And his brother, Scott Vanzo, is there, and he's the head of the 3D and all the IT department. And so I think they had already kind of been working that stuff out. And that is definitely something that we were offering. We, we, you know, our tests showed that we could do 3D that's going to integrate into the 2D really well. And, you know, I'm not sure what film Roman had in that, but um, for, you know, a show like this, it's, it's a big benefit to be able to do that. So the, between the two of them, they really worked out a, a nice system. And Scott's really on top of everything. And you can't just sell render 3D. You got to like, 3D can look like really live action, but that's not going to match the 2D. You got to like, I'm, I don't want to say dumb it down, but you got to limit what you do so that it works well and looks like it belongs there. And, and they were really good about that. And I did, like, on show two, I really jumped into it. I worked Ben. We built Bender in 3D for, like, at the end where the Amy picks him up with the magnet. And, and uh, you know, we did – so we did that scene kind of – we did a 2D version of it. He's kind of singing and kicking his legs, hee-haw style. So we did that in 2D <laughs> just so we, when we got it back, the 3D artist could really, you know, match the timing to it. And, I was going to say, your um, the honking is one that specifically comes to mind where – I, I know that Bender's uh, as the wear car was going across the rooftop and I didn't even realize that was 3D animated at the time, but that, that was an episode that's such a seamless blend between the 3D and the 2D and that was like second or third season by that time. So you've obviously really kind of understood the craft and how it blends with Futurama and when's a good time to use 3D and 2D. Yeah, yeah, we use it a lot. We It takes a lot of work to uh, 
make it blend well. And by the end of the seventh season, I mean, we had crowds that were 3D. We, oh, yeah. You know, we were mm. like, we had the ship stuff down. So the 3D artists were coming up with new ways. I remember uh, the there was an episode where Bender was delivering a souffle and the <laughs> ship was weaving through an asteroid right. thing. And so and he's, he's uh, gyroscoping, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we, uh, the director, Rami Muskies, and I wanted this scene where the souffle is still in the frame while the whole uh, bridge of the ship. So, you know, we had to ask, can we do this? We, we, I think we, I think the whole bridge had to be built and we already kind of had the characters and since they're moving so fast, you know, the characters aren't, well, they'll never be used for any kind of acting scene. They have to be like a certain smallness in the frame for Scott to uh, approve them. Uh, but that, that was great. So I, I loved coming up with, yeah. you know, how can we, what can we do? That'll look uh, right. that's kind of new. What all what the, could we not do before that we can do right. now? All the crowds in you know Attack of the Killer App toward yeah. the end, those were all you know CG crowds. Yeah, and uh, I remember uh, talking with the uh, the 3D guys about how to make that work, and and they were going crazy with trying to make sure that they would walk a certain way, mm-hmm. move a certain way. It was it was it was fantastic. Well, we're doing it a lot in Disenchantment now, and Matt, you know, he'll he'll uh, say no, these are too smooth, like. Make him look dumber. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I, I think there's some set pieces that really that take off with the that use of animation. So the one that stands out for me is the near Death Star and the, and the chase sequence in that. And I don't think it's something that's really achievable uh, on the scale without that kind of uh, uh, extra technique that you use. No, we wouldn't have done those shots. You know, mm. we could have done that show in the first run. And there might have been like one shot where you pull out in 3D and then everything else would be 2D panning stuff. That would, in any show, like even that show had 2D backgrounds in mm-hmm. it. We can't do everything in 3D. So you you intersperse them to make the audience think it's all 3D. And then you supplement that with 2D um, just to save the 3D artists. Um, <laughs> <laughs> save their clicking clicking fingers yeah, talking, um, talking, talking, talking them off the roof well and their render time and everything yeah. else I was having a discussion today about we're doing some scenes for another studio with spaceships and lasers and I was getting yelled at for putting too many lasers <laughs> <laughs> you know I'm like don't you just gotta have lasers the la- don't you just click the laser button I know, right? <laughs> it's all, it's all it all takes OS. thought it, there's no shortcuts, so I do that on my iPhone. And Stephen, for for you, I was also interested in about what it's like coming on to a series that's getting a resurgence, and and so you've come, you're coming onto an established property. I am, you know, you'd obviously be aware of the series and and kind of the the following it has, and what's you know, quote unquote, expected from Futurama. So when you come on board. Did that carry itself kind of a weight where you have to like oh, I have to adhere to this, I have to kind of meet an expectation, or conversely, was it a thing of, oh, I have the ability to give, you know, my own version of future and a bit more free reign? Like was it freeing or was there a, a kind of a, a trepidation in uh joining Futurama? Oh boy. All right, here comes the mea culpa. I <laughs> I was not a fan before I started Futurama. Ooh. I didn't, really? I didn't really watch the show. I watched like the first season. Did you dislike it? Or you just... I didn't dislike it. It was just one of those things where it's like, oh yeah, it's, the show's fine. And then just didn't really key into it. My wife actually was a bigger fan of Futurama than I was when I started on Futurama. Not to say that I wasn't a fan. But I was. <laughs> you just, you <laughs> but just I, said I, you weren't a fan. I know. But I, that's what I was going to say. Not to say that I wasn't a fan, but I wasn't a fan. Um, <laughs> but no, I very, very quickly, it was during all the movies yeah, but Stephen had uh, worked for us for right. at least three or four years at that time. Right. Drawn together, and then you uh, were on the movies, right? <laughs> sit down. <laughs> sit down, shut up. <laughs> and, yeah, and then I, then they, then I got uh, slid over. Oh, then I was on Simpsons movie for a little bit. Uh, and, and did you storyboard on the Futurama DVD movies? Yes. Okay. Yes, I did. Yeah, I was going to ask, was it the Simpsons movie that uh, kind of led you to Futurama? Because I, I saw it, because Simpsons movie was 2007, I believe, and then you started storyboarding for the movies. Was that what led you from one job to the next? Yeah, well, but those jobs were all at Rough Draft. Right, right. So since we since just moved him, when we got the 
when we heard Futurama was coming back, yeah, uh, I was supervising, and you know, let's pick our directors, and uh, Stephen was right on that list. The truth is, and, I, I just didn't leave the building. They couldn't get rid yeah. of it. Yeah. <laughs> By that time, you know, we kind of have similar theories on how we want our shows to look anyway. So Futurama is not that different. We like cinematic staging. We like so not high. people just standing in a line and only moving their forearms when they talk. <laughs> so Stephen had already been directing, you know, in our style. Yeah. And and then when it comes to Futurama, I was there as someone who'd worked on it before to just kind of say, no, Bender wouldn't do this or right. – that's good, but hey, how about we try this? You right. know, this might be cool. I mean, as far as like working on Futurama, it's still one of my most cherished memories in my career it, um, because because of the freedom. And also, too, I'm a huge sci-fi, you know, fan, nerd, slash, whatever you want to call it. So, I mean, being able to, to draw spaceships and robots and aliens uh, was like, it was, a, it was a dream come true. It really was. And, um, and the, the, the scripts, as you guys know, are just... I, I call them bulletproof because they are so funny. They're so solid that, um, you know, it's very rare that when you read a script before you start to board it and break it down, that you're laughing out loud yeah. to yourself. And and also, too, David X. Cohen is, you know, such a such a great showrunner. The writers were always available and accessible. It was, I mean, you hear the term about family and everything else, but the, the Futurama family was was awesome. I mean, they really, even though we were not on the same lot, it still felt like we were all one team. And, yeah, it um, felt it was, very collaborative. Yeah, and so it, 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 it really is. It's, it's, it's one of my... my and and most, aside from the getting to draw robots and spaceships, I always liked the shows had a good emotion and also like something usually that was really very visually challenging that we yeah. had to solve. Yeah. Like mammoths fighting spaceships. Oh, yeah. Fun of them. Uh, <laughs> murderators. <laughs> or, you know, or the, the Tron Frozen world from, uh, from Law and Order. That, yeah, Law and Order. The, tr- the Tron, the floaties, whatever the floaties. Where were they? <laughs> the predicted, prediction room. You know? Oh, the floaters. The pre Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my episode I did uh, where Fry got worms. It had oh the tapeworm what was it um, he got worm uh, it's that's parasites par- lost parasites lost yeah. that's it that's it you know it had worms inside his body <laughs> a ship inside his body a so- big sword fight um, <laughs> so great it had uh, so great. it had the holophoner first time <laughs> you know and then the writer said like hey do you like Lisa's apartment I go what do you mean he goes well we made it empty so it'd be easy on you I go oh. I get. I guarantee that's going to be the most notes we get is what that apartment right. should look like. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's an interesting point. And I know in a previous interview you talked about how, because um, you were asked about whether the directors get any say in the episodes. Um, they get, in, and pretty much you talked at it as you just get given a script, you get given the episode you're given. Did you ever find that there's an episode or did you ever have an instance where, you know, you maybe saw a script and thought, oh, I, I wish I could have been on that one. Or, or did you fight for a particular script? Like, was there any exceptions to the rule where you did get either given particular episodes because that's more your wheelhouse? Or was it just more of a random selection of, okay, Peter's going to be doing these episodes here? And It's a rotation. Yeah. I mean, let me say on Duckman and on Futurama, there were... Each one had a Star Trek episode that I did not get to direct. Oh, so that, that's still there's that, no, that's no still, favorites. That, that still anywhere. burns. That still hurts. Yeah. No, it, it's uh, oh, wait, wait. Peace just left the room. No, he's just like no. no Star Trek episode. <laughs> I gotta talk, I, I gotta go talk to him. It's a it's We're both it's Star a really Trek tight fans. schedule. There's like seven directors, and you just start the next week. So yeah. I I will say the writers have juggled an episode a couple times to get it to me. Well. Um, that's understandable. Yeah. But in the in the last <laughs> couple seasons, they, yeah. uh, which I was honored by. Yeah. But it wasn't a Star Trek episode. So <laughs> fuck them. <laughs> Live long and don't prosper. <laughs> We've had some people uh, sort of uh, pitch us some questions to ask you. So Whoa. Um, we might go to, to one or two of those. One of those is something I actually wanted to ask you myself, 
which is we really love it when there are unusual pairings of characters. Um, my favorite. Should, should we give him his his due his due credit? His due credit. Yeah. Uh, yep. So, so this this is... comes from Elliot J O'Neill. Hey, Elliot. Uh, so Elliot says, which two characters would you like to have seen have an unlikely team up in an episode of Futurama? I, the ones I do like, I really liked uh, like the tip of the Zoidberg with the professor and Zoidberg. Yes. Uh, hanging out together, which and and even when Fry was in there, just you listen to that and to think one guy's doing all those voices <laughs> yeah. is just incredible. <laughs> but they're also like really well uh they're great characters together. Yeah. Um okay. I like Roberto and anybody. I was gonna say Roberto <laughs> and, Roberto and Scruffy. Right? <laughs> oh yes. wow. Um, yes, maybe. Maybe? Roberto and Scruffy. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I just think of Law and Oracle. We were watching Law and Oracle and we just went, who the hell thought Fry and Earl were a power? <laughs> it works so damn well. It's like, well, yep, sure. <laughs> yeah, I know. I still, I mean, I, I, I was I was rewatching that one recently and I rem- it, it, it gave me a flashback all the way to when I was working on it. John's uh, <laughs> the whole thing about him talking about being with the, the chief uh-huh. and <laughs> he does this whole, and she's all like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I'm happy for you to do that for the rest of the episode in the background <laughs> while we're talking, if you yeah. like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm regretting it now. Um, I know you should. <laughs> <laughs> we, had a, we had a question from a podcast, Pods in the Key of Springfield. They're a Simpsons podcast. And they, oh, next uh, question. <laughs> they said, now that 20 years have passed, do you have a good sense of which parts of the future the show is likely to have correctly predicted? Was it us or Simpsons that predicted Trump? As the, oh, that was the Simpsons. I that was the Simpsons. Yeah. I think it was the Simpsons, yeah. Uh, I, no, I don't know. Somebody's, somebody's talking about tubes. Is it Tube? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Actually, you know what? Do you want a uh, pedantic Comic-Con-style nerd question? Sure. All right. So this comes from uh, Freezer, who is our one of our big fans. Um, and she says, uh, "Pedantic nerd question number one: How did the holophoner go from an instrument that only a few in the universe can play, and they're not very good at it, to an instrument that is being taught to children in the span of like a year or two? Well, I mean, <laughs> those are the only like five children in the universe who are studying to play it, and none of them are very good at it." It's true. So, they're, they're, you know, they, pretty... This woman's been teaching for like eight centuries now. And she's only <laughs> turned in one, one person who's any good at it. And she's looking for the next one. So. <laughs> Question answered. There it is. <laughs> Nailed it. Uh, I've also got one from uh, Committee Quest, which is a, a D&D uh, podcast out in the ether. And they said, were there any famous figures, so actors, musicians, politicians, uh, that any of you wanted to put into an episode but weren't allowed to or decided against? Did any kind of, even from a, a writing perspective, did you see that any uh, characters were um, asked to be put in and then just for whatever reason weren't able to? I'll tell you this much. If you had sent us these questions early, I'd probably have a really great answer for this. <laughs> they didn't uh, all come at the time. Yeah. <laughs> I do know that uh, on The Simpsons, in the monorail episode, mm. Conan O'Brien wrote the uh, part right. of the uh, Star Trek figure for George Takei because he thought he loves George Takei. And George Takei thought it was making fun of public transit. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they, got, they got Leonard Nimoy. He said, oh, no. <laughs> Um, here's here's my favorite question, which comes from Wayward Masquerade on Twitter, and they said, "Which voice actors are most like their characters?" Uh, I'd say John yeah, DiMaggio he's totally, is uh, he's totally better. Unless you know, <laughs> that, as far as my interactions with them, which are all work yeah. related, he is very much on his game. He's he's out there. Yeah. He's loud. He's brash. He's a lot of fun. Lauren Thomas. Maybe like he him. goes home and is yeah. very. And just, uh, he's actually British. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lauren Tom is very Amy. Does she keep falling over? Is... Yeah. yeah. yeah she but to be fair, we keep leaving banana peel. On the <laughs> uh, someone on Reddit, I, I don't have it in front of me, but they, I can, I can get you it can find it. Um, they, they, uh, they wanted to know um, if there's any chance that there might be a repeat of the uh, podcast episode that was Radio Rama. Radio Rama. I would like to see it move forward into something else. Yeah. Uh, 
I'd say it's most likely it'll be back as a TV show again, but really? You think so? <laughs> then a podcast? Yes. Oh, yeah. Feature film is definitely. That'd be really great. That'd be awesome. like a not another DVD one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, like we're a we're a podcast about Futurama. We're happy to house uh, the cast, and if you want a direct yeah, uh, episode, we'll we'll do it on here. I'll uh, hook you up with David Cohen, and he he might hook you up with some actors. <laughs> great. <laughs> we'll, we'll fly them out to Australia. It'll be great. <laughs> you didn't fly you know, us like, out. What's that all about? You. That's that. Come yeah. on. I, we're sitting in my bedroom. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, this we're is exactly what we're sitting in Pete's bedroom and you guys are offering flights to Australia for everyone else. What the hell is this? Well, you guys can come stay on my couch. That's that's so gravy. <laughs> so we can spoon on his couch as well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say. <laughs> when we talked about setting this podcast up, I just do find it absolutely adorable. I'm just imagining you guys cuddled up together with one headphone each in your ear. Well, you don't have to imagine it. That's reality. Oh. <laughs> See, it's just that makes me that makes my heart happy. Pete looks pretty nauseous after that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, his eyes say no, but his heart says, "Oh yeah." Let's get yeah. back to the yeah. show. Yeah. I do have a personal question for you. Are you both ready to help us in the patented Futurama Voices section of the podcast? I guess we have to be, right? <laughs> right. I love it. Whether they're on, whether it's Phil and Ellen on my podcast or directors for Futurama, everyone fucking hates this. Yeah, segment. everyone is and terrified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Been doing it for two and a half years and it doesn't get any better. No. Um, uh, and you guys still have. Can't read the room, can you? We did. We did pr- forewarn <laughs> these guys that we were asking them to do this, so we haven't yeah, just like sprung this on <laughs> <laughs> Oh, by the way, you guys are doing voices. Okay, bye. <laughs> Send the check in the mail. Um, well, you know what? Do you? I didn't know about the money. But I mean, Australian dollars are like what a third of, of American dollars. Is that what it is? Uh, look, it fluctuates. We're usually pretty horrible. <laughs> yeah, it's not, and not Adelaide, do- Adelaide dollars are even less, right? Adelaide yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll give a. It's guest's choice. Would you like uh, us to to start off and in- impress you with our voice acting talents, or would you like to set the stage for a? Uh, you're, you're amazing. Yeah, you start. Well, I, I have a, a personal favorite when I get dealer's choice. Um, what if he does my voice? <laughs> then you could just kind of like, what if know, he does the one I'm going to do? Acquiesce. That's perfect. Because when you say your favorite, it has to be the one I like too. Well, then it becomes a competition. Yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> okay. It's like Thunderdome at that point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shall we retire to the dungeon? <laughs> well done Very good. thank you yes. that Excuse was a really good Zoidberg <laughs> I was putting batteries in things <laughs> I'll get you Farnsworth if it's the last thing I do mm. words from yeah. yes. <laughs> thank god <laughs> sorry I was out of breath <laughs> this is a quote that my that I and my editor do every time this scene number comes up, whatever show we're working on. <clears throat> 56? 56? Oh man, now I gotta start all over again. <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, my yes. God. Oh my god, I was not expecting that. Brilliant. <laughs> High five. <laughs> well deserved. Look, you, you earned your you earned your money there. Hope you liked our show. We're done. I can't follow that. Are you serious? Come on. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, I mean, well he already did Earl, so did I? Yeah. Oh right, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Just say uh hey baby, wanna kill on here? Hey, baby. I can't even do it now. It's See, Bender, not Earl. I know, right? Uh, no, like Bender's, Bender's, Bender's Bender. Do wash bucket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, you got to kick me in the nuts. <laughs> I have to say, what's been what's been fantastic about this podcast is I had only ever watched the original run. Um, when I started uh, this podcast two years ago, I'd never actually watched any of the second series. So where we're up to now, which is just the tip of the Zoidberg, I have not seen any episodes past that point. So when you were talking about Ben, 
I was dying a little inside because I realized I don't know what it, that is. <laughs> <laughs> you got some uh, pleasantness ahead of you. Yeah, that's oh. a good one. I'm really, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really happy with that one. Right, you're happy with that one. Oh, right? sure. Yeah, that was like the season opener for mm-hmm. season. That's the bots and the bees. Yeah. Uh, yes. Seven eleven. Yeah. yeah, that was a lot of fun. It's kind of, and it's weird. It's it's a great mix of just like just some you know, as as future as the best Futurama does, you know, like some screwball. Kind of, you know, rapid fire, funny stuff. And then there's actually like heartfelt stuff in it, you know, where you're like, oh, my God, this is like for real drama. Well, it's kind of interesting because when we when we first started uh, this podcast, we were (laughs) to peel back the curtain to you guys. We were originally going to do a Simpsons podcast and then we got about nine episodes in recording and then we realized there were way too many Simpsons podcasts in Australia. We thought, well, why don't we just do one that won't take 10 years? (laughs) <laughs> and is a, a much better quality control. We thought, well, Futurama's the perfect fit. Like there's there's less episodes. Yeah. And the quality the quality's there. Like it's always been the perfect kind of a perfect storm of heart, comedy and, and sci fi. And yeah. um, infinitely more interesting. Yes, a hundred percent. Yeah, fuck Simpsons, am I right? <laughs> here, here. Well, if you did the Simpsons, you would have about fifteen years of shows after you were already tired of doing it. Yeah, yeah. I think so. It's yeah. a commitment, man. You gotta you gotta be in for the long game. But yeah, I think I think Sean um yeah, hit on something we, we really like is that it is that combo of comedy, heart and like a good sci fi hook that Yes. That really for us is when the show hits its peak. So it's really amazing to hear you sort of have the same formulation for, for what you think is really strong about the show. And well, also, too, I mean, you know, because I'm, I'm a huge Star Trek fan. So if you do happen to see my, you know, my episodes, I did for the most part sneak in some Star Trek Easter eggs. Yeah. Yeah. That is fun. I mean, so we yeah. do get the script and its track, and we are then free to do what we do. And yeah. there's a lot of stuff. That I like, I love to see directors uh, squeeze in what they can. Yeah. You know, that doesn't detract from the show, and just little maybe things. the writers don't even notice it, or else they don't notice, notice any of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Peter, that means you must really hate who who got to direct uh, the Star Trek episode um, where uh, where no fan has gone before. Uh, there was a, a director named Pat Shinagawa. She got yeah, to direct- that was her only episode, wasn't it? Because that was written by David A. Goodman. I think it was. She was an AD. Yeah, David A. Goodman is a Star Trek. <laughs> He went on to write Star Trek, right? I mean, he yes, he he wrote Star Trek into everything he worked on, and I think he actually, did he, I think he worked on Enterprise. Maybe he worked uh-huh. he worked on Enterprise. The final thing I wanted to ask that, you guys wait, is that show oh, yeah. drove me nuts because <laughs> we had to like you know we couldn't do the uniforms, we right. couldn't draw the nacelles, we couldn't. Like, <laughs> I'm surprised we got to put pointy ears on Spock, you know. <laughs> and then fucking Family Guy, Star Trek just hands him everything. They, here's the costumes. Here's the sound. Use our audio, use our soundtracks. Okay, you know what? I actually boarded the sequence on Family Guy where uh, Peter is a Borg. Yeah, yeah, that was that was. He probably he got to probably got to like trace him right off of a Borg <laughs> design. <right? laughs> um, now, is there anything that you guys would like to to spruik? I know um, you've you've touched a bit on what you're working on. We can probably you know uh, Australianize the channels and such where we know they're being on. But is there anything you guys want to? kind of highlight on, on what you're working on or what's out in the ether currently? Uh, I'm working on Disenchantment right now. We've uh, finished the second 10, the ones that are going to debut, I think, in maybe August or September. And we're about to start on another set of 20 shows. So watch that. Do you guys get the Disenchantment there in Australia? Yeah, yeah, we absolutely do. We've got the, the first 10 episodes, I, I believe, on Netflix here. Yeah, I think it's the same all over the world. So yeah, mm. second 10 will be coming out pretty soon. They're going to blow the first 10 away. Uh, they really they go to a lot of exciting places, none of which I can say, but... <laughs> you know. we'll you, you can hang tell out us it. and we won't put it in the edit. That's fine. <laughs> all right. I just told you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. Stephen? Yes. Uh, I'm actually uh, currently supervising producer on a, on, a, on a new show for a Disney Channel called uh, The Owl House. It's created by Dana Terrace, and it's about this uh, young girl who is teleported, transported, whatever means of transportation you want to call it, into this demon realm, pretty much in hell, and uh, she wants to be a witch. And it's it's really great. It's a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, it should be premiering later this year. On Disney Channel. 
but yeah, I um, I got the call from from the execs at Disney saying, hey, you know, this uh, showrunner Dana, she wants you on her new show, and uh, what do you think? And I'm like, well, when you get the call from above, uh, you, you don't refuse it. So I didn't, and uh, I moved on. You don't say no to Mickey. No, it's like <laughs> God, the, the, the hierarchy is God, and then Mickey is above God. Also, uh, for anyone more artistically inclined, if you do go to artofstevensandoval.com, there's some really dope stuff on there. I've been trawling through uh, the various social medias you have, and there's some really <laughs> awesome stuff. You just um, have to be careful because I got a notice from the, uh, the, uh, the domain provider <laughs> that my art website is infected with malware. <laughs> so, oh, <really>? no. <laughs> <laughs> so be careful. Let me go ahead and like clean that up. Give me about a week. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can go ahead and then go visit. And check it out. But I do really sincerely appreciate you, you know, putting putting that out there. You know, <laughs> I, I promise you, I'll clean it up. I don't want you to get any like Russian porn bots or anything like that. So that's why that's on my computer now. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> right. See, wait, wait, wait. I gave yes. you an alibi. Yes, Sorry, thank honey. you. I, I went to the artist even said of all like all these Russian porn bots. <laughs> I like that you're assuming this 27-year-old boy that's been doing a few trauma podcasts for two years has a wife. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> it could happen. Yeah. Uh, Peter, Stephen, first of all, thank you so much for, thank you. for coming on. It's, thank you it's been great, us. honestly. In a, in a word, it's been great. I'm, I'm known for my words. <laughs> no, we really, we really, really enjoyed this. And if you guys wanted to do it again, just, just please let us know. Because, I mean, this was a lot of fun. It, it, it's been, what, almost 10 years since I first started on, on Futurama. Looking back on those, on those wonderful memories, it's, it's great to, to share that with you guys. And, you know, you're, you're, you're really into it because when you, I was talking to Pete about this earlier, you know, when, when I was in there directing on the show, it's, it's, you kind of get lost in it because you're so focused on, okay, we got to get this done. We got to get this done. We got to get that done. And then when you kind of step back after a few years and rewatch them and you realize, oh my God, this show was really fucking awesome. And it was really, truly an honor to, to work on it. And then to hear other people who, who, who really love it. I mean, it's it's really, it, like I said, it's really an honor to be able to have worked on something that has an impact on on, on people's lives and, and that there's fans like you that out there that, that really enjoy it and love it. And um, yeah, so thank you, actually. Yeah, uh, same thing for me. <laughs> Most welcome. Yeah. Most welcome. You are welcome. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, no, you guys are doing great work. We really thank you. It. Thank you so much. Yeah, you, you guys, you guys know where to where to find Peter Avancino and Stephen Sandoval. We we've told you about the shows. If you if you would like to uh, come back to us next week, we'll be tackling Ghost in the Machines, an episode which is directed by Patrick M. Verone. Hey, no, there you written go. by Patrick M. Verone. Oh god damn it! I you know what? By, like directed by they Ray put Claffy. Wow, look at that encyclopedic knowledge. It's oh, amazing. Yeah. You know what? Like, I was trying to jump the gun, and I just got schooled. And I supervised, feel like directed by ass. me, <laughs> Peter. Uh, and who is the <laughs> special guest for that episode? Then, hmm? um, Fillmore. Did they go to the? Was there a guest on there? I don't know. Dan yeah. Castellaneta. How did you not know? Oh, come on, as the robot. Dad, <laughs> he's a recurring character. That's not a special. Ooh, but I am very special. But he is man. credited as a guest star, so you know I, I will have to defer to our friends. <laughs> down yes, I got my Futurama cred back. <laughs> Bam, right there. In your face. You're reading off a list. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, if you guys would like to contact us uh, for anything that's happened in this episode and elsewhere, you can do do so by emailing us at babybeardmedia at gmail.com. Uh, hit us up on Facebook. Uh, we're always happy to hear from you on there as well as on our Instagram as well where you can see uh, what we get up to in between podcasts. And if you if you like what we do... Please rate and review. Or otherwise subscribe to the podcast. That's Thank probably you. the best way you can help us. Yeah. Um, and until that time, I have been Sean. I've been Phil. And I realize I didn't tell you guys to do this, <laughs> but if you uh, would please oblige me and just saying I am followed by your name. <laughs> I've been Peter. And I've been Stephen. <laughs> oh, beautiful. See you guys. And uh, thank you. Bye. Thank you, thank you very much. If 
you guys feel like swearing, th- this show carries the explicit rating. So, Stephen, I know you're working for Disney, but it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he works for fucking Disney. Yeah, fuck that. <laughs> yeah, I'll throw to you guys. I'll say, you know, here's Peter. Um, and then you can say your little, your little hilarious line. Um, and then to Stephen and then Phil will throw yeah, back. But then, but then we're going to have to say another hilarious line at the end. <laughs> that first, there's one at the end. And now another hilarious line at the beginning. Why don't you do your end line first? Because that's supposed to be more hilarious. Guys, we're paying you. This should be easy for you. <laughs> You're to paying do. us? Wait, whoa, I didn't know about this. Why, neither did I, actually. Wow. Well, all right, then. Let's talk. Well, this is going to end up being the longest po- episode of your podcast ever. Pretty <laughs> On the internet, there is no interviews of you. I found one Comic Con panel, and I waited until I heard the guy say your name. I went, "Ah, oh, fuck." Okay, that's... <laughs> well, how'd you get Avanzino? Well, come on. I mean, Avanzino is like that. That's like a cool name. How about Avanzino? Or, or, or you can do Avanzino. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you got to do the fingers. I know we're not on camera, but you know the whole like Avanzino. Avanzino. Sure. Oh. <laughs> I did. I did the hands as well. I did the Italian. The sig. The signoid hands. Yes. Which are absolutely not Italian. We could feel. We could feel your hands all the way over here. <laughs> Is there anything that you really don't want to um, be asked about or talk about, mm. or um, anything you've been asked too many times? Nobody really talks to the directors. <laughs> we haven't been asked anything too many no. times. Well, I mean, you guys <laughs> said that you couldn't, you couldn't find any presence of us online as yeah. far as like interviews go. So I usually go. sit there quietly while John DiMaggio and Billy West go off for forty minutes. That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> because they're which I will admit is entertaining. <laughs> If we haven't even started the 10 seconds. <laughs> no, we, we haven't. But I have been recording for the last five minutes. So this is comedy gold. Wait, what? All of Stephen's F words are going to oh, be shit. in there. <laughs> God damn it. Fuck. Okay, All right. 10 seconds. <laughs> we'll, we'll 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Sweet. Oh, you know what I just realized? Oh. One of us are meant to start with the shut up and take my podcast. W- what are you doing? Am I doing it? Yes. Okay, sure. <laughs> oh, my God. God damn. Lost my okay, 10 seconds. And that will pretty much be the end of our record there. Um, sorry, I didn't let you know how that ends. <laughs> We're professional podcasters, don't you know? We get paid. <laughs> yeah, we don't. You're getting paid? Oh, I get paid. All oh, right, yeah, okay. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to understand this now. Sean, is, you're the only one who's getting paid, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. I've been hoarding the money. <laughs> that sweet, sweet podcast money. And Ellen's mm. usually with us too, but she had to work today. She's too good for us. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's 100%. She I, is I, making money. I, can't, I started on Xmas Story. Yes. Was my first episode, yeah. Awesome. Directed by Peter Avanzino. Hey! hey. hey. Yeah, Golf clap. And uh, who was the special guest on that? No, no. <laughs> John Goodman. <laughs> Boom. I think he's my favorite guest star. Really? God, I love Beck. I have to say, Beck's appearance I was going to say, not amazing. Beck. Oh, no, for me, it's Donovan, totally. <laughs> uh, Donovan holds was up. Was Donovan really on it? In our, our Deep South, the Deep South. He yeah. just appears. He just appears briefly. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Does he sing about Atlantis? Yeah, he, he does, does, yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't track as an Australian reference. We, I, had, we, we had, had to look him up. We had absolutely no idea who he was. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, hey, in Atlantis. The Star Trek episode is that um, William Shatner only agreed to do the episode if both himself and Leonard Nimoy could be in the booth together so they could work off each other. And that's just another adorable thing I find, is that they had to do the voices together at the same time. They just wanted to hang out again, I think. Just like we want to do with you. Yeah. Uh, so I guess, what, same, same time next week? Yeah, oh, 100%. <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing anything. What about you? You guys are yeah. free, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, we'll definitely, you know, we'll saturate, uh, I mean... Social media as much as we I have that very limited social media. <laughs> or we, just, we'll do our part. Or just right, you know, just, you. just pop it at pop it at the end of Disenchantment, one of the episodes. <laughs> yeah, <and that's> we'll... <laughs> Stay tuned for the next <laughs> Would you feel what? weird talking to Matt Green? Oh no. That would be like I, I can't get like him. not in a, not in a bad him. way. <laughs> oh. oh you can't dangle that. I mean you can't you just did, so